That was really good. Um, my name is Tyler, and I'm the family pastor here, and so I'm subbing in for Derek while he is out, and I know that is a disappointment to some of you. So what I'm going to do to cheer everybody up is we're going to give away a present. We're actually going to give away a present every week. So I think for, so this is a three-part series on the topic fake. And this is, so this is what Derek has assigned me with. But to kick it off, we're going to be giving away a present each week, and they're, they're all fun presents. So one of you is sitting in a seat that has, you have something under your seat. And if you are the lucky, if you are the chosen one, then you will get a present. This is so exciting. Any winners? You, you can't, you cannot tackle anyone, you cannot switch seats. No, no one got it? Nothing? Keep looking. Okay, switch seats. Uh-oh, we have a winner. Okay, you, hopefully we won't embarrass you or make you nervous or anything, but can you come up here? We have a present for you. Woo-hoo! I'm Tyler, by the way. What is it again? Autumn. autumn. Autumn, everyone, everyone. Autumn, this is week one, so we're on the right present. You meant, I'll take this. And Will you open it and show everybody what it is? That would be awesome. It's up on Amazon. I love getting Amazon presents. I'm here to help. Oh, what is it? Here, I'll take this. Is there another, that was it? Yeah. What is that? Fake snow. <laughs> Just what everyone wants for Christmas. Fake snow. Merry Christmas. Good to have met you. Enjoy. I don't know what you can do with that. But you can do something with it. That's going to be some good stage decor. We are so glad that you're here. Like I said, we're starting a new series called Fake. And so, um, I don't know about you, but I love Christmas. Does anyone love Christmas? I love Christmas time. And the more kids that I have, the more I love it. (laughs) Like, it just gets better because you get to enjoy it through them. I mean, you enjoy it, and then you enjoy it through them, and so it just brings back all the things every time that you love. It's just, it's a blast, like setting up a tree. Does anyone have their tree set up yet? Yeah, setting up the tree is fantastic. It's not fantastic doing it, but when it's done, it's fantastic, and so, and the decorating, and the lights, and driving around to check out the lights. I'm sure there's a place in town that has some awesome lights that I need to check out, but decorating, and the lights, and the, the smells, you know, and the Michael Buble, right, and the Frank Sinatra, even better. But I love all of it. I'm not against any of the Christmas stuff. I, we do it all as a family. It's just fun. I don't think you are anti-Christian if you do some Christmas things, okay? And so, but it's just too fun. It's just too fun. The presents, but in the middle of the crazy, busy, super fun season called Christmas, it seems like year after year what I have to come what I come to grips with, what I have to come to grips with is, what is this really all about? Like, what is the Christmas season really all about? And I think that if I figure out what Christmas is really all about, that changes everything. It changes my focus. It changes everything. I remember when I heard the truth about Santa Claus, and I'm not going to say it here, because I'm just not going to do that to you, but... It didn't really hit me too hard because I was kind of a skeptic from the get-go. I mean, I saw my parents, and I saw the presents, and I saw both at the same time. So, but the more I think about it, what hit me was I was writing this message is, I think the one thing that I don't like that's fake is a fake beard on Santa. Like, I am not going to pay I'm not going to wait in line for an hour and then pay to have my kids sit in your lap and you don't even have a real beard. That just, 
a fake beard. You had all year. And you did nothing. And it's just, it's just too, it's a fake beard. If you're going to be Santa, if you can't grow the beard, it's not in your genes. You are not gifted to be Santa. But if you're going to do the Santa thing, you've got to have, it's got to be a thick, white Santa beard. Otherwise, that's just shameful. It's just worldly, I think, you know. And then there's Christmas cards, right? There's Christmas cards from everyone, from everywhere, and they come in the mail, and it's, it's exciting. You know, you go, oh, little, and they look, everyone looks, it's just like perfect model, magazine-looking quality. I'm like, this, it's the epitome of fake, okay? They come in the mail, and then you have to compare you and your family to them. It's just not right, We do a Christmas card every year, and I know that it's the epitome of fakeness because we do it every year. And you know how many shots it takes to get that one shot where everyone is there and everyone is in the same place, looking in the same direction with the same smile, looking happy? You know how many shots it takes to do that? A lot. It takes a lot. I think that there should be a rule that everyone gets one shot. You get one shot. I think it would be hilarious. It would, Christmas cards, I would so look forward to getting those in the mail, right? They would be totally different. You would have these demon-eyed, red-faced, crying faces on all the kids and the parents are frustrated. Jimmy, get over here You're right now. Come here. It, that would be how it is, because that's how it is. It's crazy. The time, it, the time in between getting that perfect shot, that's the reality. That's the reality. Some kids wouldn't even make the shot. They wouldn't make the card. You, where's Jimmy? He didn't make the card this year. <laughs> we said, come here. He didn't come. <coughs> it just has his name. Christmas is the biggest, speaking of Christmas cards, right? Because they're expensive. Christmas is the biggest money-making season of the year. It's the biggest money-making holiday. Halloween's kind of creeping up on it. But unless, unless you get out of the matrix, I think we just get steamrolled by the culture. And we've made Christmas fake. We don't know what Christmas is really all about. But even if we do know what it's really all about, we don't celebrate what it's really all about. I've never heard a kid or an adult say, I can't wait to celebrate the birth of Jesus this year. I've grown up in church, I don't think I've ever heard that. Or, I can't believe we get to celebrate the miracle of the gospel this year. We live a fake Christmas. It's so much more about the decorations and the food and, and the smells and the music and the lights and all that. We celebrate everything. But Jesus. But even if you want to celebrate Jesus as a family, you're like, okay, 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 okay. I, I want to, I'm gonna, those things are cool, but Jesus is, okay, so I want Jesus to be the main thing. He's going to be our focus as a family this Christmas. Well, then you now have to cut through all the Jesuses of our culture to get to the real Jesus so that you do celebrate what it's really all about, the real Jesus, because you have fake Jesuses. I listened to a whole sermon on this, like the Jesuses of pop culture, and it was really, some of it was really funny, some of it was really sad. But our culture has made up all these little nice Jesuses to suit our fancy and to be who we want him to be and to do what we want him to do for us and to give us what we want him to give us. And so you have, like, like the one, I didn't see the movie, but I saw the clip and it was funny, but the one that Ricky Bobby prayed to. He prayed to the little baby, the eight-pound, six-ounce baby Jesus, because that's the Jesus that he liked. That's the Jesus he wanted to pray to. And his wife's like, well, you know he grew up, right? And he's like, yeah, but I prefer, like, I like the eight-pound, six-ounce, so that's who he prayed to, to ask him to give him what he wanted. But we're, cons we're Christmas consumers, and we can just as easily be Jesus consumers, but if Jesus is the way that you like him and he says what you want him to say and he always does what you want him to do, 
He's probably a fake. You know how you know the real Jesus? First of all, he's the Jesus of the Bible. Because that's, that's how he's revealed himself to us. And second of all, he often gets in your face and says, hey, you're wrong. Or this is not the way God intended you to be. And you need to change. He does that often. He does that to me every day. And I'm like, yes, Lord. The real Jesus didn't come to make us feel better about ourselves. He came to free us from ourselves and to save us from our miserable, self-centered lives. Everything that the culture tries to throw at us to say it's all about you, that just makes you miserable. And God sent Jesus to free us from that so that we could be all about God and be God-centered, free to love God, and free to love and serve others. And that's what makes you truly joyful. <coughs> Here's a test question for us. Here's a test. You like test questions? I don't like test questions. Would you still like Christmas if it was only about Jesus? If it was only about Jesus. So no, no, dri- no driving around and, ooh, ah, the lights. You know, no food. No family coming in, no presents, no candy, no tree. Would you still like it? Would you still come to church? What would be different? I think think everything would be different. The way that we saw things, the way that we thought about things, what we got most excited about, and what we got our kids most excited about. What if on Christmas you were most excited about seeing God work in your life and in your family's life? You were so excited about, you have this season, and it's like a gift from God. You have a season to set aside, to zero in on who Jesus is and why he's so great, and to celebrate that as just personally and with your family. I think that we don't see God working in our lives at Christmas because if we're honest, we don't want him to. We don't really want him. We would really rather just have the fake. The food time. The family time. The presents time. The lights. We like the fake and we prefer the fake. Because we don't want God to intrude. Because we know he's going to tell us to change. And we don't like change. We would prefer to settle for less. We set, so we settle for less. C.S. Lewis wrote about this, and he said, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. We're far too easily pleased. God offers us infinite joy and we settle. What what would it look like, though, if you didn't settle for less this Christmas? What would that look like? If you determined you would celebrate Jesus more than anything else. This season, or sorry, this series is meant to wake us up and to help us think about the true, authentic Jesus and what Christmas really should be all about. Not just so that we'll understand it, but so that we'll be blown away by it. So we're going to be in Isaiah 7.14. And so I'm going to kick it off with an Old Testament prophecy. And the thing that I really want to hammer on is God with us. God with us. Because to me, that's what Christmas is really all about. So this is Isaiah 7.14. It says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. So this is a very well-known Bible prophecy. Isaiah wrote it around 700 B.C. And it's so cool how 700 years after he, about 700, after he prophesied this, it's perfectly fulfilled. So cool. A virgin 
Mary, we just sang about it, conceives by the Holy Spirit, gives birth around 5 BC. You have this incredible, mind-blowing, miraculous birth to a son. He's 100% God. He's 100% man. That's Jesus, God with us. And so what hit me when I was studying this verse is that God, he says he's going to come after us. And then he comes after us. He isn't just sitting back, you know, waiting from afar, watching, you know, like he set, set the world in motion, and now he's like, I wonder how it's going to play out. He's not doing that. He is engaged. God is engaged in our real world. And he wants us to know the real him. And the only way that could happen is by him coming after us. The only way that could happen is by him pursuing us, by him revealing himself to us. Because we're all running the other direction, shaking our fist at God, saying, leave me alone because I want to do what I want to do. And I want to keep doing that. I want to be my own God. I want to do what I say is right. I want to determine for myself what is right and what's wrong. I don't want you to be the authority. And so he's pursuing us. And we've broken our relationship with God and only God himself can fix it. Ever since Genesis 3, we're running that way. And so God's coming, running after us in Jesus. He has to come after us to fix our problem. The creator entered into the creation to clean up our mess and to fix our brokenness and to rescue us from Satan and sin and death. To take us from slavery to freedom. And this didn't happen somewhere in a galaxy far, far away. Right? Some of y'all are really excited about a movie coming out. <laughs> Some people are freaks. It's great though. Um, I'm, I'll watch it. This didn't happen. This isn't Middle Earth. This isn't some legend. This isn't made up. This isn't fake. This is, this is history. This is reality. A lot of times... What we have to do is we have to cut through all the things that we've, you know, the coloring books and the pictures and all the different things and go, this really happened. That's one of the hardest things, I think, as a, as a preacher, as someone trying to communicate the Christmas story, you're like, this is real. This is a real event. God is real, and he really did come into his creation. <coughs> real time, 5 B.C., Joseph and Mary, real, Joe, just average Joes like me and you. Real people, real birth in Podunk, Bethlehem. We can relate. It's a lot like, it's like, where's Clovis? You, you tell people where you're from, right? Where is that? That would be what, that's Bethlehem. Real city. It's really, this whole story, really incredible. It's really true. And the next thing I want to hit on here is this name, Emmanuel. It literally means God with us. And that's who Jesus is, the God-man. He's 100% God. He's 100% man. He's the creator with his creation. And as I thought about this theme, you know, Derek's like, hey, fake. He explains the whole thing to me. I'm like, hey, fake, fake. And as I was just kind of meditating on fake, the one thing that really hit me is God hates fake. God hates fake because it's completely against everything that he's about. It's, it goes against who he is in his nature, his character. He is real. He is reality. He defines reality. The ultimate fake is Satan. Satan is darkness faking to be light, right? He is ugly, Faking to be beautiful. He is, this will kill you, faking to be, hey, this is going to feel good. He's just a trickster and a fake and a fraud and a phony. And I hate it when he tricks me. And so Jesus came into the world. I was just thinking about this. One of the big points for the Christmas story is Jesus entered into our real world to show us the real God. And to show us the real us. So he's like, 
here's who God really is. I mean, you read the Gospels, you read like John, and you're going, that's what God is like. When you see Jesus, that is God. That's what he's like. And then you see his perfection, and that shows you your sinfulness, right? So he showed us who God is, and then he showed us who we really are. Not just our badness, we're bad, but he also showed us how loved and valued we are to God. Did any of you ever see the show Undercover Boss? Undercover Boss, I haven't seen it a lot, but I saw it one time. I thought it was a great show. And um, the thing that I liked about it is you had this guy who's, you know, he's in the ivory tower and he's making all the money and he's the CEO or he's, he's the boss, right? And all of a sudden, he enters into his workplace with the common Joe lowly employees and he's like wiping windows with them and talking with them. And by the end of the show, everything's cha- all the relationships are changed. It's a whole new level. And as I watched it, I thought, God's like the ultimate undercover boss. He came into our world. He walked, literally walked in our shoes. He went through everything that we could possibly go through, and then some. He literally took on the full wrath of God against sin. He felt the full gamut of emotions. You know, whatever you're going through right now, the book of Hebrews says, we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Because he he went through it all. The the stress, the loneliness, the abandonment, the, uh, the when when he was hanging on the cross, the perfect relationship, we have no idea because we don't have, none of us have a perfect relationship He had a perfect relationship with the Father, and he's hanging on the cross, and the Father turns his face away, and it's broken. And so he experienced that brokenness. He experienced work. He experienced everything, abandonment, fatigue, death. And through it all, he did what we could never do for ourselves. Most of us, when when we have pressure on us, we find comfort in something we shouldn't. Jesus never gave in to temptation, and he always perfectly obeyed God. He experienced more temptation than you and I know. Because you and I, at some point, will give in to temptation. He never gave in to temptation. Because you don't really know temptation until you resist it. You don't really know your enemy until you engage him, until you fight him. I was talking, <clears throat> well, the person that always gives in to temptation doesn't know temptation like the person that always resists it. My younger brother is a competitive bodybuilder, and so I confirmed this with him. But he says that the, the person that goes to the gym and just stares at the weights doesn't really know the weights like the person that grabs them and picks them up and lifts things and does things that you're supposed to do with the weights. That person knows the weights and then experiences the soreness. But that resistance, that pushback, that experience, Jesus resisted temptation to the point of shedding drops of blood. And then in the end, he died resisting and pleasing God. So we have a God who went through the ultimate experience. What I'm trying to say is we have a God who is God with us. We can relate on every level. We have a God who through his very life, death, and resurrection, he did all that so that we could be with him. He wants to be with us and he wants us to be with him so that he could be our great God and Savior who is Jesus Christ, who is God with us. No other religion has a personal God that can relate like our God. A God that knows the ins and outs of you like you don't even know. You're like, I don't even know why I'm feeling like this. God knows why you're feeling like that. I don't even know. I feel overwhelmed. He knows. The hairs on the head, numbered. It's awesome. We have a God that understands your little bitty problems And he actually cares 
about little bitty you in microscopic detail. God wants you to be with Him. So you know what the real Christmas is about? I think it's just about that. It's as simple as God with us. It's about God giving us the gift of Himself. It's all about Jesus. Jesus is God with us. It's all about Jesus. But for most of us, I think if we're honest, Christmas isn't about God with us. It's more like lights with us. A tree with us. Presence with us. Family. That's a big one. Family with us. Some people are like, family with us. Some family. But our, that's, what, that's what we really celebrate. And our kids pick up on that. But you can take the best presents, you can get the most loving family in town, the best food, the coolest light show with the music when you play the radio and you tune it, it's awesome. You can get all of that stuff, but it's no, it, none of it compares to having God with us. All the other stuff will leave you wanting. Jesus alone fulfills. If you heard nothing else this morning, Jesus alone fulfills fulfills. He alone is what your soul is crying out to be satisfied by. There's a God-shaped hole, only He fits it. He is the ultimate gift at Christmas, and all the time. I want to read us two verses in Psalms that I hope will stir in us a desire to be with this God that is so great in, in this season, and then we'll land this plane, okay? So this is Psalm 1611. Psalm 1611. It says, you make known to me, this is David talking to God, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is what God has given us for Christmas. Life. Fullness of joy. Like some of us have never even dreamed. Pleasures forevermore. The satisfaction of our souls. All in Jesus. And now Psalm 42, 1 through 2. It says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My prayer for us this Christmas is that our souls would thirst for God like, like that, and that we would celebrate Him coming to us in Jesus. And if you've never received the gift of Jesus, you could do that this morning. You could have God with you this morning. You just got to repent and trust Him, that's all. And so let's celebrate Jesus most of all. Let's, let's show our kids that what gets us most excited is Jesus. Let's celebrate the truth that if Jesus is our Savior, we have God. We have God. So I'll pray. We'll get the band to come back up here. And we'll have a time to reflect and to seek the Lord and um, if you need anything at all, I'll, I'll be right down here. But this is your time. God, we thank you so much for a season set aside to think about what really does matter most. And God, we thank you that you did all that it took to be with us. Jesus, thank you for your promise that you will be with us always, even, even to the end. And thank you for sending the Holy Spirit so that we always have you with us. God, there's nothing better, there's nothing more enjoyable, there's nothing more satisfying, there's nothing that brings peace or contentment or anything like just being with Jesus. So God, we thank you for that ultimate gift this morning. If someone doesn't know Jesus this morning, I pray that you would reveal to them how great you are and how great their need for you is. So I pray you would save souls this morning. 
And God, for those of us that just need to be awakened and reminded to, of your greatness, would you do that for us? That's what we want for Christmas. We want to be awakened to a desire for God like we've never had. Would you do that for us in Christ's name? Amen.